Hello and welcome from Davos and uh, we're here to discuss what Morgan Stanley calls the trillion dollar blind spot. Uh, women and minority owned businesses have insufficient access to capital and investors in Morgan Stanley's view are missing a huge opportunity. I'm here with Tom Nides, the vice chairman of Morgan Stanley. Thank you for coming, one of the key authors and drivers behind the report. And Rebecca Huang, who is the co-founder of Rivet Ventures, a venture capital firm specialised in investing in this class. If I can start, Tom, maybe with you. Uh, you recently sponsored this research uh, on uh, the, the billion, the, the trillion dollar blind spot. Uh, you were look at, looking at uh, women and minority investors' access to capital. One major finding was that while the majority of investors' perspective was that the funding landscape was balanced and fair for this investment, actually you found that was very much not the case for the recipients. Could you talk more about sure. this? Sure. Well, first of all, um, Rebecca, it's an honor to be with you because you actually walk the talk and actually know what you're doing vis-a-vis -vis investing. And you'll probably give me real world advice and counsel what we should be doing even more effectively at Morgan Stanley. Uh, we decided to go into this not because it was the right thing to do, but because it was an enormous amount of money at stake. We've determined it's several trillion dollars of investable assets that are not seeing investors. Very simply, when we went and turned it on its head and we went to investors and said, do you think you are doing enough for uh, women and minority investors uh, and ideas? And they said, sure we are. And we, so we then we looked at the data and we said, actually what's happening is three things. Number one, you're actually not seeing any women and minority investors. In fact, we looked at about a quarter of the amount of investors that actually came got through the door. So 75% of the investors were white males. Hard to actually decide about an investment idea when you don't see them. Number two, the actual investment for the male counterparts was a million dollars, and the women and minorities was $200,000, an $800,000 gap. And, and third, we actually looked at that the expectations for uh, women and minority uh, investment ideas was higher. It was a higher threshold, more due diligence, more investigation, more asking the tough questions. And so we basically said, wait a minute, you have to think about this in a different way. You have to force your uh, portfolio managers to make sure you're seeing the investment ideas. If you don't see the investment ideas, there is no way you're going to be able to invest in them. And so that was the idea of the research, and that's how we're trying to be thoughtful in how we tackle the problem. And Rebecca, as Tom says, you are a real, a real specialist and an expert in this. You set up a business that was focused on this type of investment opportunity, particularly for women-owned women businesses. Uh, as an investor, what do you look for? What opportunities do you think other people should be looking for in this investment class? Yeah, thank you, and thank you for inviting me for the panel. I'm so pleased to see Morgan Stanley at the forefront of this very important issue. Uh, we started Red Ventures because we noticed that even though 80% of all the consumption is decided by women, and many of the user decisions and adopting new technologies and apps and the new products that we uh, create in Silicon Valley are actually decided by women, uh, the money and the capital was not flowing to these companies. And these are perhaps not the sexiest uh, ideas or market opportunities. Uh, they are overlooked markets that for 30, 50 years have not had any disruption or innovation. And so we started to have a lot of conversations with entrepreneurs who uh, would knock at every single door at Silicon Valley and they would not see people with the backgrounds as, and the ethnical as well as the gender backgrounds that they needed to be able to communicate that pain point that they're trying to solve effectively. So we started a venture fund and we're specializing on, on these companies that have as the main demographic female users and consumers. It's, fantastic. It's, a, it's a fantastic uh, story and a mission. If I can turn it around for a second and look at it from the other perspective, these same group of people are sitting quietly. They may have fantastic business ideas, great opportunities, innovation, access to a market many of us don't reach, but they can't find the investment dollars. What advice do you, and I'll come to you, Tom, as well with the same question, what advice do you have for the, that, those, group, those people? How do they get in the door with you and with others? Yeah, I think I would recommend that they do a lot of research uh, about the investor in particular that they're trying to access because um, typically investors will 
put their money in what they know, and they will base a lot of those experiences in their personal backgrounds. So if you're trying to uh, sell an idea around, for example, fertility, it's a very good idea to make sure that the investors that you're talking to do have some personal appreciation of that pain point in the market. Uh, two, investors uh, work with pattern recognition. So mm -hmm. it's very easy for somebody who's been in the Valley for 30 years to spot the next you know, Mark Zuckerberg style uh, behavior or mannerism, but they don't have as much data on female founders and minority groups. Just historically, they haven't had enough exposure. So we as a group, uh, we have to create those patterns for the investors and educate them on these overlooked market opportunities. So I think it's very important that um, female uh, founders as well as minority founders uh, get together and amplify the voices of each other so that we can elevate the entire space. Thank you. And Tom, people, uh, Rebecca's talking there about, uh, uh, about companies seeking out the right investor for them. Do you think the investors exist and people aren't finding them, or do actually pe are people not investing in the right uh, I think there's two things. One is, as I go back to the original thesis, if you don't see the ideas, you can't invest in the ideas, right? So there is a demand. We need, it's a push-pull. We need demand that the, the big private equity or uh, equity check writers are calling on the carpet. They need to be understood where, let me look at your portfolio. Let's determine what uh, amounts that you've actually given to women and minorities. And you need to be aggressive about that. And we need to make sure that those who are not doing it, they're called on it, number one. Number two, um, I think it's all about mentorship. It's about relationships. You know, you call it pattern recognition. It is about finding friends, family, people who know people who have capital. Uh, it's not only just the idea, but let, let's be clear. It is all about opportunities. And one of the things we try to do at Morgan Stanley is try to give people that opportunity to get into the door. We've uh, tried through our innovation lab, which we'll yeah. talk about in a minute, was really try to identify companies who are owned by women and owned by minorities, give them some capital, and tell them that they can go and tell everyone that Morgan Stanley has invested in them. All you need is that opportunity. You just need that little bit of a, a chance of that leg up. Because listen, at the end of the day, uh, the market is is male dominated, unfortunately, uh, in this in this class of private equity. With the idea that even when you get the check, it's getting materially smaller than ma your male do dominant uh, com counterparts. So it's up to us to make sure we are focused on the right uh, uh, individuals, the right ideas, the right mentorships, and give them the leg opportunity to open that door. Well, let's, you said we'd talk about it, but let's talk about it now. The, the Innovation Lab is a perfect example of not doing research and talking about things, but actually really backing this hard. What's the background? Yeah, I mean, that? listen, I, we, it's not the original idea. There's plenty of incubators out there, so I don't want to take like, the idea that we've come up with some new fangled idea. What we did was very simple. We basically put out applications to anyone who happened to be a female or a minority-owned company. It didn't matter what sector. We got 400 applications for 10 slots. Uh, it was interesting. Um, uh, these companies would uh, live with us for a year. We would help them with their, not only their business plans, uh, we'd help them about how they need to raise more capital. We talked about how they structure and sell their product. Listen, you can have the best product in the world, but if you can't sell it to anyone, it doesn't matter. So we opened, opened doors for them to sell their products. They then came to us and said, listen, uh, we gave each company $200,000, dollars to $200,000, $250,000. And they said, listen, we want you to take a piece of us. We want you to have an ownership stake. And I didn't, quite frankly, didn't want it. Uh, and they said, no, this will help us raise capital. Their point to me was, once you have the good housekeeping seal of approval with an institution like Morgan Stanley, mm -hmm. your ability to go to Silicon Valley and go to other angel investors and even more in even you know, A and B and C funding levels with Morgan Stanley behind it, um, that really helps. And to your point, uh, it is a bit of a game, and it is a bit about about connections and continuity. And we at Morgan Stanley are trying to do and help in a very small way mm -hmm. to try to help those individual companies. And these companies have been unbelievably successful. You know, listen, 70% of them won't work, but 30% will. And that's, by the way, that's great odds. And there's, yeah. and, and you know better than us because you do this every day. This is very hard. It's hard for men, and it's really hard for women and minorities. Uh, as well, and even sometimes even more difficult because the access to the capital isn't there. So is there, a, is there an educative process to the way in which you get investors to look at these opportunities? We want more ethnic minority, more women investors themselves, but are you actually trying to change their lens, their frame of reference? Well, we need people like Rebecca, right? right. I, mean, I mean, look at her resume, look at her track record, right? She knows what she's doing. I mean, this, the reality is success breeds success. 
Okay, the reality is when they see people like Rebecca, who is who is basically operating at the level in which you're operating at, people say, "I want to, I want that. I want to be. I not only do I want to emulate you, I want to, I want to get into the game." And it's frustrating, you know. You you get in the game and you call people and they don't return your phone calls. You don't even get in the door. You have a great pitch, a great idea, and you can't raise the capital. But you watch people who have um, established themselves with success, and that's what we're trying to. We're trying to showcase those people who succeed to give people the confidence to get out there and to keep pushing forward. And, and for Morgan Stanley, we're going to try to call investors on the carpet a little bit. We're going to want to praise those who do well. And quite frankly, uh, we'll give a little grief to those who don't. And I think the Valley's figuring this out too. They're going through their own transformation about mm -hmm. capital and access to capital. You know way more about this than I do, so maybe you want to inject a little bit of reality to all of this. Yes, and I can't emphasize enough how important it is that people like you, Tom, are, are talking about this issue and are putting dollars, capital, and validation to these founders. Uh, I think that's the most important missing piece today uh, in this equation, that we have uh, men uh, in the sector uh, who are helping us, women and minority founders and investors, to continue scaling the movement. Uh, in Silicon Valley, there's more awareness. Uh, I think it's a very good time. Even at Davos, you see a lot of the sessions that are talking about this topic. Uh, most of them are oversubscribed, and that's very pleasing to me to see, uh, and that makes me feel very optimistic. But we still have a lot of work to do uh, in terms of the numbers. If you see the number of women in boards, you see the number of founders and CXO level uh, positions at startups, uh, also the number of investment partners who have a lot of influence in these um, uh, large investment firms and VC firms in Silicon Valley, we still have a long way to go. Uh, and so I think part of all this is continuing to educate the mm -hmm. community. And this is not just about uh, the power of women, but really the market opportunity. Uh, Anecdotally, my portfolio, if you look at the best performing companies today, they're all fem female lead led. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's not something that we designed this way. We invested both in men and women, but uh, they're doing terrific. And then we look at the data on the market opportunities and the number of dollars that women move on a daily basis in consumption, you know, mm -hmm. trillions of dollars. Some estimate that it's larger than China and India combined as a consumer market. Um, and that has to be uh, something that moves the needle for the investors. Well, you know, it's so, I, I, and I, you, you may agree, but this is not about just doing the right thing. Yeah. This is about making money. I, I, I mean, we happen to be doing the right thing, but it's about making money. That's what we call this the trillion dollar opportunity. The reality is, to your point, there's some really, really good ideas out there that are owned and thought of and managed by women and minorities. And we're not seeing that opportunity. So, so this is very important because there was this long-held view that sort of social investing class was somehow less lower returns for a different class of investor. You refute that absolutely. Well, it's ridiculous. I mean, the reality is the same. It's, it's where we were on sustainable investing ten years ago. Ten years ago, people thought they'd had to compromise on returns. You can't walk into an investor now and talk about your sustainability portfolio and say you're going to you're going to somehow compromise on returns. They'll throw you out of the office. They're expecting you to have market returns with a sustainability focus and lens, not dissimilar to this. You know, if I went into your office or suggested that you should invest in me, and by the way, you get subpar returns, you'd throw me out of your office. The fact of the matter is, we we have to force folks to understand that there's an un. Um, bought uh, a level of investment opportunities out there mm -hmm. that if you see those opportunities, and let's just remember, the, the female and minority, you know, not black and Hispanic, make up an enormous consumer population. The Hispanic market itself is dramatically improving, much greater than the white majority of the, of the marketplace. So just from just basic consumer knowledge, you want to own companies that women manage, understand both consumer and technology. And if you don't do it, you're just not smart. And this is not about, again, trying to make some great Davos opportunities. This is about making money, doing it the right way, and making sure there's plenty of opportunities for everyone. So could I just ask you uh, probably a, a last question? I'm on the uh, board of the Women's Foundation in Hong Kong. There's a lot of work done in this space. But truthfully, we see this as a global problem, not just a US problem. There's a US, problem, a US focus to this conversation and this report. But you must see this all around the world. 
Uh, well, I'm originally from Argentina, so I have a lot of exposure to Latin America, and in fact, I'm starting a new fund there. And yeah. um, it's the same issue, but women, even in Latin America, I would say perhaps even more powerful in terms of the consumption decisions, and there are many overlooked markets in the region. So it's a very exciting place to be looking where we are sort of contrarians at this initial stage uh, of this sector space, and so it's a, a great arbitrage opportunity for many of us. Yeah, listen. I mean, uh, these are these are not um, these are not uh, U.S. centric. Uh, this is a global. If you look at the markets in China, you look at the markets in Latin America, you look at through Europe. In fact, I would say the Europeans are better in some cases than we are. They're more forward lean. The Europeans were way ahead of the U.S. on sustainable investing. Um, you know, maybe we can lead a little bit more on women minority investing. But I think ultimately uh, this is a global issue because guess what? There's global opportunities. Uh, there's global ideas. There's global abilities to make money. And so I think uh, doing this right, I think everyone will ultimately have a very successful uh, investment opportunity. Thank you. Uh, Tom, Rebecca, I really appreciate it. Thank you very much. This is a terrific report and uh, well worth the read. But also, if you're an investor out there, watch out because Rebecca's eating her lunch. There's, a, there's an opportunity on the table and you ought to be taking it. Look hard. Thank you very much.